All right. Greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracal here or Adams Van Sale. Tonight, not to shine a light on the goings on down south, but to shine a light on one of my favorite essays in uh, that I read in recent years. And uh, as you know, I've done a, one of these special discussion stream episodes before when uh, I did my 100th episode of uh, Stream of Consciousness. This time around, it's a special episode to celebrate 500,000 total views on this channel. So I will be reading another one of my uh, favorite essays and I will be commenting on it, uh, adding some of my own analysis and ideas as we go along. Uh, I see uh, we've already got some people in the chat, but yeah. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope you are ready for a nice uh, episode specifically on the idea of the leisurely class or spe more specifically on luxury beliefs. And I chose this essay specifically because I think it's still relevant, increasingly relevant in our time. Uh, our time is maybe a strong word, seeing it was written in our time. It was written in uh, 2019, but uh, in the internet age, 2019 feels like uh, generations ago. So the essay that I'm going to be reading today, let me just uh, get it on screen. Um, one second. Let me share on screen. There we go. Um, that should work. And uh, let me just go to this. All right. <clears throat> so you'll be able to read along uh, as we go along. I see here, Sideliner Opinions is glad to share the celebration with you, CC. It's been quite a journey. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it is, has been quite the journey. So this essay is called Thornstein, Thorstein Veblen's theory of the leisure class a status update and it's by rob henderson it's on his sub stack but it was originally written in 2019 so let's begin i was bewildered when i encountered a new social class at yale four years ago the luxury belief class my confusion wasn't surprising given my unusual background when I was three years old, my mother was addicted to drugs and my father abandoned us. I grew up in multiple foster homes, uh, was then adopted into a series of broken homes and then experienced a series of family tragedies. Later, after a few years in the military, I went to Yale on the GI Bill. On campus, I realized that luxury beliefs have become fashionable and status symbols. Luxury beliefs are ideas and opinions that counter confer status on the rich at very little cost while taking a toll on the lower class. In the past, people displayed their membership in the upper class with their material accoutrements. But today, luxury goods are more affordable than before, and people are less likely to receive validation for the material items they display. This is a problem for the affluent who still want to broadcast their high social position, but they have to come up with a clever solution. The affluent have decoupled social status from goods and reattached it to beliefs. So I think you can start picking up why I chose this essay uh, for our reading here tonight. I think we are still uh, surrounded by luxury beliefs, whether that be in South Africa or in the United States, or in the UK, or in any European country, all across the Western world specifically, we see this chasing of luxury beliefs. And uh, here in South Africa, there are many examples, and I'll get into some of them, uh, but let's uh, continue first, uh, a little bit more far, farther down this piece, or this essay. Human beings become more preoccupied with social status once our physical needs are met. In fact, research indicates that sociometric status, respect and admiration from peers, is more important for well-being than socioeconomic status. Furthermore, studies have shown that negative social judgment is associated with a spike in cortisol, hormone linked to stress, that is three times higher than non-social stress, non-social stressful situations. We feel pressure to build and maintain social status and fear losing it. And again, this is building on an idea that I think, I think a lot of people today, when they look at their ideological opponents or politicians or people behaving strangely in the realm of politics or activism, 
there's often a question of what's driving them, what is, um, what's causing them to act in this way. And uh, often there's a lot of it. People present a lot of explanations, uh, money, power, psychopathy, whatever. But I think here, um, uh, Veblen and uh, by extension, uh, Henderson in his piece makes a very compelling argument that that is that those many people today are driven by the pursuit of status and admiration from their peers. I think there's also a connection here between woke capital, the thing that we see corporations going woke and um, and becoming so incredibly blatantly ideological at the expense, at their own expense. I think there's also an element here because I don't completely believe the adage that uh, get woke, go broke, because uh, the what we've clearly seen is that businesses, even though they know it's going to cost them money, they still plow ahead. They still go through with many of these ideological projects of theirs. So we have to find another explanation for what's going on here. And I think the status explanation actually holds a lot of water. If you look at, for example, the CEOs within those companies, they want to be known as progressive. They want to be known that they're uh, pushing good morals, that they are upstanding people, and they want the admiration of their peers and the other affluent and status-rich people in their group. But we'll see uh, as the piece goes on. We'll get more into that. Okay. So we can, uh, I will continue here. It seems reasonable to think that the downtrodden might be most interested in obtaining status and money, but this is not the case. Inhabitants of prestigious institutions are even more interested than others in prestige and wealth. For many of them, that drive is how they reach their lofty positions in the first place. Fueling this interest, they are surrounded by people like them. Their peers and competitors are also intelligence status seekers. Uh, they pers persistently look for new ways to move upwards and avoid moving downward. The French sociologist Emile Durkheim understood this when he wrote, quote, The more one has, the more one wants, since satisfactions received only, uh, only stimulate instead of filling needs, end quote. And indeed, in re recent research supports this. It is the upper class who are the most preoccupied with gaining wealth and status. In their, in their paper, the, re the researchers conclude relative to lower class individuals, upper class individuals uh, have a greater desire for wealth and status. It is those who have more to, to start with, i.e. upper class individuals who also strive to acquire more wealth and status. Plainly, high, high status people desire status more than anyone else. Let's see a sideliner opinions in the chat before we continue says life for most people on earth involves little status, luxury, and leisure. Capitalism made it possible for some to live like kings. And I think they, when we look now, well, let's continue a little bit more and I'll, I'll get into some of those ideas as well. We continue. Furthermore, other research has found that absolute income does not have much of an effect on general life satisfaction. Relative income, on the other hand, has a positive effect. Put differently, making more money isn't important. What's important is making more than others. As the researchers put it, quote, increasing an individual's income will increase his or her utility only if, if ranked position also increases and will necessarily reduce the utility of others who will lose rank, which may explain why increasing the incomes of all may not raise the happiness of all, even though wealth and happiness are correlated within a society at a given point in time. The thing here is, and I think this also relates to the whole equality debate, even though many people today uh, that would be, let's say, not 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 people that are uh, completely impoverished, but people that, let's say, live a lower middle class or working class life, they uh, materially are very much well off, but uh, relatively uh, in in the the historical picture, but uh, relatively to the society around them, specifically the upper class, they are not. And uh, I think the point here that's being made, that that relativity um, definitely plays a role into satisfaction, uh, even though I think 
this whole idea that wealth is the pinnacle of uh, determining happiness is a, a very modern, almost uh, <laughs> neoliberal idea that we need to be cautious of because the, the whole ideology of line go up uh, hasn't really produced the, the happy societies that were predicted. Um, I mean, just because a society's GDP goes up or because the wealth of a society goes up, what if that society, as we see in many uh, prosperous nations, what if that society has record-breaking uh, drug overdoses or depression or uh, people committing suicide? I think there's more nuance to happiness. We can't just look at, are people getting more money or earning more money? Um, I think <laughs> a lot of countries that have a very high GDP and a very high average income also struggle with uh, modern diseases of uh, nihilism, meaninglessness, high suicide rates, drug overdoses, opiate addictions, and um, depression and anxiety. All right. So let's continue. However, this preoccupation with relative income appears to be confined among relatively affluent Americans. A 2021 survey found that college graduates say closing the gap between the rich and poor is more important a goal than ensuring Americans don't live in poverty. There we go. There, ding, ding, ding. That was what, that was what I was talking about earlier. It's the strive for we all need to be equal, not that we all need to be living a, a life where we're not uh, worried whether we're going to have food tomorrow. Anyway, we continue. In contrast, individuals with only, with only a high school diploma say ensuring Americans don't live in poverty is more a more important goal than closing the gap between rich and poor. So see that distinction already coming in. The Americans, uh, college graduates say closing the gap between rich and poor is more important than ensuring Americans don't live in poverty, while those with just a high school diploma say ensuring Americans don't live in poverty is more important than closing the gap into, between the rich and poor. So it's starting to build now to where we're going. Um, <laughs> Fingal says, uh, has reaching 500,000 views increased Aaron's happiness? I wonder, either way. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to uh, reach this uh, milestone. Uh, I just like little well, milestones literally like little markers of uh, of growth in in regards to a project i mean this is my hobby i don't get paid for youtube i don't really my i don't even monetize my channel um so it's all about just my growing my my channel and uh, seeing people enjoy my content and that's that does bring me happiness all right uh let's continue the majority of U.S. adults are not college graduates. Thus, while most people care more about ensuring people don't live in poverty, the most educated members of society care more, more about inequality. You might think that rich students at elite universities would be happy because they are in the top 1% of income earners. But remember, they're surrounded by other members of the 1%. Their social circle, their Dunbar number, consists of 150 baby millionaires. Jordan Peterson has discussed this phenomenon, citing figures from his experience teaching at Harvard in the 1990s. Peterson noted that a substantial proportion of Ivy League students go on to obtain a net worth of a million dollars or more by age 40. And yet, this isn't enough for them. Not only do top university graduates want to be millionaires in the making, they also want the image of moral righteousness. Elite, graduate, elite graduates desire high status, not only financially, but morally as well. And this is a point that I've made as well many times, where people sometimes, uh, I think it was, uh, ugh, let's not even go into a specific example, when you see someone on social media take a bizarre stance, like, uh, ugh, I don't know, um, the vaccinated, ugh, the unvaccinated need to be locked up or uh, uh, I am pro this cause because I care about humanity or whatever. All these types of like bizarre statements or uh, all white people need to pay billions in reparations. I can say that as a white person. I say that <laughs> it, 
it all those types of statements and people sometimes you'll see people in the reply section say how much are you being paid to make this decision or, or, or to to post this this view or this propaganda and i always remind those people most of these people posting bizarre strange like ideological posts like that like completely zealous stuff they're not being paid their reward is that warm fuzzy feeling of moral superiority that's exactly why I wanted to read this piece as well. We need to understand why people make these posts and these uh, proclamations, these virtue signals. I mean, that has become a, a concept very well known in our time. But we need to understand, and this is the point that I wanted to make. Many of the people you see on social media saying these crazy things, saying really like zealous psychotic sometimes in regards to the uh, ideological position and the things that they say they're not being paid to say it don't make the mistake of thinking oh the only way someone would believe something this crazy is if they were paid to post this propaganda that's not true they're being rewarded with that feeling of moral superiority they are playing for status they're not playing for money that's we're going to get into that as we uh, go further along uh, right um ob smart also says congratulations thank you very much uh sideline opinion says the best intelligence test is what we do with our leisure that's a interesting point all right let's continue um for our affluent social strivers luxury beliefs offer them a new way to gain status Thorstein Veblen's famous leisure class has evolved into the luxury belief class. That's an important point. Veblen, an economist and sociologist, made his observations about social class in the late 19th century. He, he compiled his observations in his classic work, The Theory of the Leisure Class. A key idea is that because we can't be certain of the financial standing of other people, a good way to size up their means is to see whether they can afford to waste money on goods and leisure. This explains why status symbols are so often difficult to obtain and costly to purchase. These include goods such as delicate and restrictive clothing, like tuxedos and evening gowns, or expensive and time-consuming hobbies like golf or beagling. I don't know what that is. S such goods and leisurely activities could only I'm clearly not in the leisure class. Such goods and uh, leisurely activities could only be purchased or performed by those who did not live the life of a manual laborer and could spend time learning something with no practical utility. Veblen even give, goes as far as to say the chief use of servants is the, is the evidence they afford of the master's ability to pay. For Veblen, butlers are status symbols too. Converging on these sociological observations, the biologist Amot Zahavi proposed that animals evolve certain displays because they are so costly. Now, this is also a classic that you see in nature. Let's see first what examples Henderson gives, and I'll go into that also a little bit. The most famous example is the peacock's tail. Only a healthy bird is capable of growing such a plumage while managing to evade predators. This idea might extend to humans too. More recently, the anthropologist and historian Jared Diamond has suggested that one reason why humans engage in displays such as drinking, smoking, drug use, and other physically costly behaviors is because they serve as, a fitness, as fitness indicators. The message is, I'm so healthy that I can afford to poison my body and continue to function. Get hammered while playing a round of golf with your butler and you will be the highest status person around. It's an interesting point that he makes there about uh, nature as well. I mean, this, I forgot that he actually make, draws this parallel and Henderson draws this parallel in his piece. This is exactly what we see with animals like the, the peacock, but also spe specifically with birds with big plumage and a lot of feathers that are easily uh, caught by hawks uh, or even any type of animal that uh, has something that doesn't really serve a defensive purpose or, a, or any type of practical purpose just there for display. Um, yeah. Slippery Pickle says, anyone who's owned a boat knows sometimes those things start owning you. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
Sideline and her opinion says the end of labor is to gain leisure, Aristotle, 322 BC. That, right, let's continue. Conspicuous convictions. Now we're getting into precisely the meat and potatoes of this piece, why I think it's so relevant to our time and to understanding the just insanity that we see around us, the new zealots of, of our time. Veblen proposed that the wealthy flaunt status symbols not because they are useful, but because they are so pricey or wasteful that only the wealthy can afford them. A couple of winters ago, it was common to see the students at Yale and Harvard wearing Canada goose jackets. It is necessary to spend $900 to stay warm. Is, is it necessary to spend $900 to stay warm in New England? No. But kids weren't spending their parents' money just for the warmth. They were spending the equivalent of the typical American's weekly income, $865, for the logo. Likewise, as students, are students spending $250,000 at prestigious universities for their education? Maybe. But they are also spending it for the logo. This is, this is not to say that elite colleges don't educate their students or that Canada goose jackets don't keep their wearers warm. But top universities are also crucial for inculcation into the luxury belief class. Take vocabulary. Your typical working class American could not tell you what heteronormative or cisgender means. But you visit Harvard, you'll find plenty of rich 19-year-olds who will eagerly explain to you when someone uses the phrase cultural appropriation. What they are really saying is, I was educated at a top college or university. Consider the Veblen quote. Quote, Refined tastes, manners, habits or of life are a useful evidence of gentility because good breeding requires time, application, and expense, and can therefore not be com com cannot be if and can therefore not be compassed by those whose time and energy are taken up with work. End quote. Only the affluent can afford to learn strange vocabulary because ordinary people have real problems to worry about. Another excellent point. Have you, I think you've all noticed this when you watch a debate on television or anywhere where there's uh, some university professor today, some liberal or leftist professor. Uh, whenever they're backed into a corner, or even just when they have an opportunity to speak, they start talking about all these strange words that you've never heard about the institutions of structural, uh, uh, privileged uh, cultural appropriation. Uh, heteronormative, as they said in the piece, um, all these strange uh, words and the concepts that are not that are not accessible to the average person on the street. I don't know what you're talking about, but what they're doing is they're flexing, as as argued in the piece. They're not flexing just to show how smart they are. They are flexing their status as well. They're showing I went to a, only someone who went to a very expensive university is able to use have a vocabulary like this. I see a Sharon Westfall says, congrats, don't watch YouTube very often. When I do, I watch your podcast. I always find it enlightening and educational. Much gratitude. Thank you, Sharon. I'm, I'm deeply flattered that uh, when you do use YouTube, you watch my channel. But it's also good that you don't watch YouTube often. Go do what, uh, whatever you like, but outside in the real world. Um, YouTube will always be here if you want to watch something, but uh, don't let it be your life or let it uh, consume all your time. All right, let's continue. I hope you're finding this essay interesting uh, before I continue. This is, um, it's one of my favorite uh, essays to explain a lot of the what's going on around us, why people do and say the things they do. All right, let's continue. The chief purpose of luxury beliefs is, is to indicate evidence of the believer's social class and education. Only academics educated at elite institutions could have conjured up a coherent and reasonable sounding argument for why parents should not be allowed to raise their kids and that we should hold baby lotteries instead. Then, what's, the, what's that famous quote? Uh, some ideas are so ludicrous, it takes an intellectual uh, to believe them. Or is it, it takes an academic to believe them? I'll, I'll, I'll check later. But yeah, um, that's exactly what's being, uh, being argued here. Some ideas are so ludicrous and insane that it takes an academic to believe them. 
Then there are, of course, certain beliefs. When an affluent person advocates for drug legalization or defunding the police or open borders or loose sexual norms or white privilege, they are engaging in a status display. They are trying to tell you, I am a member of the upper class. Affluent people promote open borders or the decriminalization of drugs because it advances their social standing and because they know that the adoption of these policies will cost them less than others. The logic is akin to conspicuous consumption. If you have $50 and I have $5, you can burn $10 and I can't. In this example, you, as a member of the upper class, have wealth, social connections, and other advantageous attributes, and I don't. So you are in a better position to afford open borders or drug experimentation than me. Or take polyamory. I recently had a revealing conversation with a student at an elite university. He said that when he sits, uh, when he sets his ten, Tinder rad uh, radius to five miles, about half of the women, mostly other students, said that they were polyamorous in their bios. Then, when he extended the radius to 15 miles to include the rest of the city and its outskirts, about half of the women were single mothers. The costs created by the luxury beliefs of the former bore by the latter. Polyamory is the latest expression of sexual freedom championed by the affluent. They are in a better position to manage the complications of novel relationship arrangements. Just think Samuel Bankman Freed. Um, he was in a weird polycule relationship. Uh, we see it with all these billionaire and, and uh, upper class types. Uh, today they are all in these multiple partner relationships and what's going on there is exactly what's being uh, henderson explains here continue and even if it fails they have more financial capability social capital and time to recover if they fail the less fortunate suffer the damage of the beliefs of the upper class then there's the finding that in the 19 that in 1960 the percentage of american children living with both biological parents was identical for affluent and working class families, 95%. By 2005, 85% of affluent families were still intact. For working class families, the figure plummeted to 30%. And there's a, uh, you'll see on the screen now, there's a, a graph. So children living with both biological parents, affluent families in 1960, I'll just read that again, 95% working class families in 1960, 95%. Affluent families in 2005, 85% working class families in 2005, 30%. The Harvard political scientist Robert Putnam at a Senate hearing said, quote, rich kids and poor kids now grow up in separate Americas. Growing up with two parents is now unusual in the working class, while two-parent families are normal and becoming more common among the upper middle class. Upper class people, particularly in the 1960s, champion sexual freedom, loose sexual norms spread throughout the rest of society. The upper class, though, still have intact families. They experiment in college and then settle down later. The families of the lower class fell apart. Today, the affluent are among the most likely to display the luxury belief. Okay, this is very important. Let me just start from the, the beginning. Today, the affluent are among the most likely to display the luxury belief that sexual freedom is great, they are, though they are the most likely to get married and least likely to get divorced. So again, it's that point. Let me just go back here. Um... Ah, uh, no, I've lost it now. It's the, anyway, I'll remember it, uh, not verbatim, but paraphrased. So the luxury beliefs of the, the upper class, the they don't carry the costs because they have the means and the resources to not carry the costs and to uh, not fail or when they fail to be able to recover. The Their beliefs spread throughout society. Their beliefs are adopted by the lower classes, but they don't have the resources that the upper classes do and therefore are destroyed uh, by these luxury destructive beliefs and that's the the, the evil that we are, that we have to, to deal with here um let's see um, all right the rabble and the rich this aspect of luxury beliefs is worrisome as I noted in my original luxury beliefs essay, material goods have become more affordable and thus less reliable indicators of social class. Status has shifted to the beliefs we express, and beliefs are even less expensive than goods because anyone can adopt them. 
They are not financially costly. And according to Veblen, along with other social observers like Paul Fussell, people try to emulate the upper classes. The elite want to differentiate themselves from the rabble with their visible badges of luxury. But, when, but then the class below tries to emulate the elite and the stratum below, stratum below that as well until the style has trickled down to the rest of society. But the upper class does not just stand by while the lower classes adopt their beliefs. They want to distinguish themselves and move on to a new luxury belief. So the best example is uh, open borders here in South Africa as well. So South Africa has many problems due to just the porous border. We have a in massive, massive inflow of illegal immigrants into South Africa. And it's straining the infrastructure. It's straining uh, communities. A lot of drugs and crime is, is coming through uh, our borders as well. But uh, people living in, in high security villages and estates, people that uh, live in safe, rich neighborhoods are the biggest supporters of open borders, borderless Africa, pan-Africanism. This goes for black and white in South Africa. Look at all the big pan-Africanists, the black pan-Africanists in South Africa, all wealthy black politicians, millionaires, billionaires even. They're all the big pan-Africanists. You don't find a pan-Africanist there on the sidewalk begging for money. The pan-Africanist drives up in his brand new BM, black BMW and tells you about how Africa needs to be borderless because he can afford that luxury belief. But he's also, he's also, he also holds and, and, and proclaims that luxury belief because it signals status. It shows I have enough money that I can believe that I can promote these very destructive policies because I have enough money to escape the consequences of these policies. You see it in, in again, South Africa is a good example. You see it with the support of policies like expropriation without compensation as well. All these wealthy white liberals in Cape Town and your Johannesburg, your Pretoria, everywhere, all these wealthy urban white liberals are these big supporters and leftists are these big supporters of uh, expropriation without compensation. But they know they have enough money that if uh, expropriation of co without compensation happens Zimbabwe style in South Africa, they can be on the first jet out of here and go immigrate to a nice uh, a country much, much whiter than South Africa. Always like clockwork. It's almost like a law of physics. These support these liberal and leftist supporters of destructive policies always immigrate to whiter Western countries. But they want to destroy these countries that they first that they lived in in the first place. And then people like us, people that want to preserve the societies and communities here, yeah, that don't want to live in a destroyed, failed state, that say that warn against the destruct these destructive policies. We have to sit with the mess because a lot of us either don't have the resources to immigrate or don't want to immigrate just willy nilly and be a global citizen. But yeah. So this is also why this piece is so relevant. I think in South Africa, we have a lot of uh, uh, these types of people that have luxury beliefs. Same, look at the people that talk about white privilege. Who was it the other day? Uh, uh, that XDA uh, politician, Van Dam, Zil Van Dam, what's her? I can't even remember her name. But she was writing, a, a, or she was said in an interview or something the other day, she said that when she earned her first paycheck of 16,000 Rand a month, she it was so much money, she didn't know what to do with it. But she's like one of the biggest wit gevaar, Afrikaner gevaar type of people out there, white privilege preachers. But in her life, she, she was traumatized by the fact that she earned so much money, she didn't know what to do with it. I mean, that's exactly the case study of what we're talking about here. But uh, they talk, uh, those types of people propagate all these destructive ideas because it gains them status. Look at many of, I'm not even going to name their names. You know who they are, the usual suspects online. These um, uh, uh, <laughs> white supporters of the ANC, like these uh, praise singers of the ANC, the new dawners and all these types of people. Look at all, all these uh, uh, supporters of expropriation about compensation on social media. Look at their lives. Look at their... Do they look like working class people to you? Do they look like uh, people that that uh, are normal earn normal salaries? No, they all live in massive mansions in Cape Town and Johannesburg and live in wealthy uh, <laughs> yard in the, the New Dawners, um, in wealthy security estates. 
and then they propagate all these destructive ideas like uh, uh, national health insurance and expropriation of our compensation and borderless Africa. <laughs> it's, it's really evil. It's, it, it's, a, it's a cynical status chasing game. That's why I wanted to read this piece because you have to understand what's driving these people. It's not money. They're not being paid to do it. To them, status is more, and and projecting moral superiority is more important than money. Because money is not a problem for them. They've got so much money, they don't know what to do with it, clearly, as they even self-admit. But yeah, um, let's continue. I mean, that's this is a central point we need to understand. Um, let's see. All right, let's continue. Um, uh, to, yeah, and over time, these beliefs are embraced down the social ladder. This is easy to see with fashion. The author Quentin Bell, in On Human Finery, wrote, quote, Try to look like the people above you. If you're at the top, try to look different from the people below you. End quote. The elite's conspicuous display of the luxury beliefs falls into this pattern. Their beliefs are emulated by others, sending the elite off in search of new beliefs to adorn. The affluent can't risk looking like the hoi polloi after all. Or consider an analogy from art. The psychologist Steven Pinker in How the Mind Works writes, quote, In an age when any Joe can buy CDs, paintings, and novels, artists make their careers by finding ways to avoid the hack, hack, hackneyed to challenge jaded tastes, to differentiate the cognoscenti from the del I have no idea what. See, again, I'm not part of the leisure class. I don't know what those words mean. <laughs> I don't know what cognoscenti or del deletantes is. I didn't go to a fancy enough university, clearly. <laughs> Artists uh, want to differentiate themselves from what's been done before and what others are currently doing. And so do the affluent. Moral fashions change over time for the same reason clothing and art change over time. Moral fashions can quickly spiral as more and more members of the chattering classes adopt a certain view. Once the view becomes passe, the upper class aiming to separate themselves then update their moral inventories. Veblen still reigns supreme, but in a different way. As Pinker puts it, quote, what is common is within the pecuniary reach of many people. Hence, the consumption or even the sight of such goods is inseparable from an odious suggestion of the lower levels of human life, end quote. Funnily, uh, funnily enough, Stephen Pinker, if you go look at what he writes today, he is someone chasing status through his luxury beliefs. He is a classic example of a luxury belief individual. Um, I just find it funny that he's quoted in this piece. I mean, uh, nothing wrong with the, the quotes, um, uh, but he has become, or maybe he's always been, I've, I've not been an avid reader of Pinker. I don't know his intellectual journey, but from what I have read of him, he is a classic luxury belief uh, champion. <laughs> The affluent do not want to be seen. Let's continue. The affluent do not want to be seen with common goods. They view themselves them as distasteful. Today, it's not just common goods they view as distasteful. It's beliefs too. The affluent dreading an odious designation dis, uh, resist displaying commonplace beliefs. Those beliefs are for the little people. Instead, the upper class want to be seen displaying luxury beliefs. That's why I chose this thumbnail for this episode as well. Look at the people in the thumbnail. They're all these uh, affluent. 20 somethings uh, protesting for some luxury beliefs like defund the police and waving Antifa flags. Look at some of the people that uh, are like in Antifa and people that uh, are part of like violent riots in America. They all come from affluent backgrounds. They're not working class people. They all come from like affluent neighborhoods and are in, and the, are clearly very rich and very well off and their money is not a problem for them. They are vying for status. They are trying to gain status. They are trying to moral signal. That's what's going on here. Let's see. Here. Uh, all right, let's continue. Um, uh, where was I? Yeah. Modern neuroscience did not exist in the 19th century. But Veblen might have been amused to learn that the same regions of the brain involved in rewards such as eating chocolate or winning money also activate when we receive compliments from strangers 
thank you for complimenting me on the 500,000 views. <laughs> uh, so maybe uh, you weren't so wrong after all of that comment earlier in the in the chat. Um, uh, compliments from strangers or learn that people we will never see, will, ne will never meet, find us attractive. Veblen wrote, quote, immaterial evidences of past leisure are quasi-scholarly or quasi-artistic accomplishments and a knowledge of processes and incidents which do not conduce directly to the furtherance of human life, end quote. In his day, the leisure class spent a lot of time accruing useless knowledge and partaking in activities that have the appearance of intellect, intellect and artist, artistry but have no functional utility. These activities didn't help anyone, but they did make their enthusiasts look good. But what, what might Veblen have made of Twitter, given these observations? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Feiner says, Nancy. And uh, Dachbrecher says, oh, a synthetic middle class. Sideliner opinion says, quote, I'd like to live like a poor man with lots of money, Pablo Picasso. Right, let's continue. Status spirals. Oh, we're almost done. Uh, the economist and social theorist Thomas Sowell once said that activism is a way for useless people to feel important, even if the consequences of their activism are counterproductive for those they claim to be helping and damaging to the fabric of society as a whole. The same could be said for luxury beliefs. They enable the believer to display their status. Luxury beliefs are similar to luxury goods, but present new problems. Attaching status to luxury goods or financial status meant there were limits to how much one could display. For example, fashion is constrained by the speed with which people could adopt a new look. But with beliefs, the status cycle accelerates. A rich person flaunts her new belief. It then becomes fashionable, fashionable among her peers. This can take place within a week. Then a new stylish belief arises, while the old luxury belief trickles down to the social hierarchy and wreaks havoc. All right, that's the end. Um, you can find this piece. There's a link to it in the description um, of this video. Wait, there we go. There's a link to it in the description of the video if you want to go read it yourself or want to share it. Um, I read this back in 2019 and found it fascinating because I think the whole question about what is driving many people around us to completely lose their minds, that the left has gone insane, <laughs> if you will, uh, if you want to use that terminology. Um, what is driving this insanity? What is driving that people will make these absurd claims like uh, we need to abolish borders or we need to defund the police or uh, we need to make all drugs legal or uh, it's, hap hap it's uh, healthy to have dozens of uh, uh, partners instead of marrying and rather having just an open relationship with many partners. Why Why are people actively pushing these ideas? And like I said, don't make the mistake of thinking they're being paid to make these statements. Don't think people are being paid to propagate or champion these ideas. Some people are, but the vast majority are not. The vast majority are being motivated by that warm, fuzzy feeling, that feeling of moral superiority being able to tell people you are disgusting because you believe you have this non-luxury belief. I am holy and righteous because I have this belief. That's what's going on here. And when you understand that, uh, ah, there we go. This is the, a great example of it. Hello says pathological altruism. Yes. This idea where you display more love, care and empathy for people that are not Part of your family or your community but uh, you actually show like uh, almost an aggression and uh, uh, antagonism towards your family and the people in your immediate vicinity and your community or your culture it's a pathological altruism where for example um, you have uh, people in your own country that are impoverished and struggling but uh, the people with pathological altruism would rather import millions of would rather uh, let millions of illegal immigrants into their country and help them than uh, help the people that are already struggling in their country. Um, yeah, Vingel says uh, oikophobia is the other word for for that phenomenon. Um, yeah, and we're seeing this all across the Western world in South Africa. We're seeing this. The supporters like i said earlier of i mean the, the, this there shouldn't even be a debate 
expropriation without compensation, destroying private property rights, national health insurance, open borders. These things are objectively guaranteed to destroy South Africa, like to, to rip the entire society apart, or the societies and communities within it, and create absolute chaos. But you have these people in the ivory towers supporting it. Another good example is uh, many of these uh, rich, affluent intellectuals in South Africa supporting the EFF. I mean, objectively, if the EFF, as an extremist Marxist-Leninist left-wing party, racial, full of racial hatred and violent fantasies, wanting to murder, my, chanting about murdering minorities... If that party were to gain control, I mean, anyone with a shred of common sense would know it would destroy South Africa and uh, cause un unimaginable chaos and destruction. But then you have these uh, uh, rich tunnies in sitting, sipping the uh, uh, <laughs> the uh, gin and tonics, and uh, saying, "Oh well, the Julius Malema is so." is so nice he says all these nice things and he, he should be president one day let's give him a chance or uh with the anc a anc like a through and through corrupt party that's destroying south africa racial with its racially discriminatory policies immoral policies destructive policies rampant corruption and then you, then you have these new donors the people that said give cyril a chance cyril's going to save us drama is the the second coming of I mean, they were, I'm pretty sure there were some of them that said he's the second coming of Jesus. Um, I'm pretty sure if you go look through some of their uh, opinion pieces, they'd say something like that. Writing pieces like, Sir Ramaphosa is majestic. Now we all must follow. They're not doing it because they genuinely believe that, well, some of them, some of them might be just, might believe some of this but the majority of them are very unsure in their beliefs they're just they're just chasing the, the status of having these luxury beliefs um i think that's it's not the core it's not the no, no core is the wrong word it's not the exclusive cause but the chasing of status is playing a very large role in many of the the just ap absolutely insane takes we're seeing out there Let's see. Uh, uh, Sideline opinion says, as a conspiracy theorist, I believe some of these ideas are made fashionable for a reason by people with some ulterior motives. Well, if you look at how destructive they are. Dachbreaker says, I think you said it perfectly on Peñol's podcast. Stop infantilizing, Julia. Oh, of course, yeah. That's also, yeah, after this, if you want to go listen to a discussion I really enjoy taking part in, go to uh, um the penwell show uh, you can see how you spell it there p-e-n-u-e-l um uh or you can just search adams van sale and you'll find um an interview that was recently published that's got already almost sixty thousand views about a lot of things uh afri forum the anc apartheid alternatives urania everything uh, no i don't think we talked about urania but we talked about a, a bunch of topics there so you can go check it out um i, I think it's uh I, I enjoyed it a lot um, but yeah, it's, uh, I hope you enjoyed the, this, this, uh, this essay. Um, thank you everyone for, um, helping me reach 500,000 views on this channel as a total. Um, all of you that share my content, that like, that leave a comment, that, uh, send it to your friends and family. It, it really helps. And it's, uh, I'm glad that people find value and insights in my in my content that's what motivates me with this channel like i said with uh with this hobby um <laughs> definitely not money and uh i don't think there's a lot of status in um saying you're a youtuber with nine thousand subscribers so um or five even five hundred thousand views for, for that matter um so yeah it's for me it's just uh it's it's nice to see that people find value in the type of content that i create and uh, if i can help people gain some new insights learn about new authors have some ideas that they uh, present some ideas that they've never thought about then uh then it's then i enjoy what i what i do but i uh, I've, I've never stopped enjoying what i do um, i'm very blessed in that regard um hello says i like luxury beliefs better yeah 
me, I do too. Uh, pathological altruism and oikophobia, very academic terms again. I mean, we need to be talking in terms that everyone can understand immediately. You don't have to just, it, it shouldn't be necessary to explain these things. They should just know what you're talking about. That's why I like luxury beliefs as well. I completely agree with you. I mean, you immediately understand what people are talking about. All right. So, guys, a little bit shorter episode than usual. Um, but, yeah, I'm done reading and I've shared my thoughts on the topic. I don't want to artificially just uh, keep the, the stream going. Thank you very much for tuning in. If uh, you like this topic or the stream, give it a like. Uh, also, if you're not watching live, you can still take part in the conversation by uh, leaving a comment in the comment section. I read all of them, respond to as many as I can. And then also, yeah, if you are subscribed to this channel and you want to know when I go live, uh, click that little bell next to the subscribe. It'll let you know, hopefully, if YouTube does its job when I go live so that you can catch it live. You can be in the live chat so that you can be part of the content. Like I always say, it's nice to have your comments here on the screen. It adds a little time capsule. It shows what who was watching, what were you saying, what questions were you asking. It's not just me here on the screen. You're part of the content and you're part of the time capsule that's saved when this video is processed and when it stays on my channel. Sideline Opinion says, thank you, CC. Look forward to the 1 million views, hopefully one day, onward and upward. The next uh, milestone now is 10,000 subscribers. Hopefully we can reach that before the end of the year. All right, guys, I've kept you long enough. Hope you have an excellent evening, a safe week, and enjoy yourselves this weekend as well. Um, make some time for family and friends and to maybe spend some time outside uh, touch grass. Uh, Ethni Roni, Ethne probably, Ronnie says, thanks, explain so much as to why supposed, supposedly intelligent people believe rubbish, which is so obvious. Yeah, it's a luxury belief. It's the it's the luxury sports car equivalent of beliefs of, the, of our time. Um, that's why you, for example, see in South Africa, some people live in like a shack, but they have a sports car next to it. It's the same type of thinking. It's signaling status. The status is what a lot of people are chasing. And with these luxury beliefs, some of them get very, very crazy. But all right. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. And God bless.